the North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed episode on the fastest hour on television. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. And don't forget that our archives are all listed on YouTube, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. Check us out. We have a lot of ongoing discussions about a lot of things that are important to you. Uh, we've been running a series lately on uh, the Ten Commandments put up by Dennis Prager, Prager University. And we are up to commandment number eight. Commandment number eight, do not steal. Here's Dennis Prager. This commandment is unique in another way. It is the only commandment that is completely open-ended. All the other commandments are specific. The fifth commandment, for example, states that it is our parents whom we should honor. The sixth commandment, prohibiting murder, is about taking the life of an innocent human being. The seventh commandment, prohibiting adultery, is also specific to a married person. Two unmarried people cannot commit adultery, but the commandment against stealing doesn't even hint at what it is we're forbidden to steal, which means that we cannot take anything that belongs to another person. And that, in turn, means three big things. First and foremost, the commandment against stealing has always been understood to mean that we are not allowed to steal another human being, what we call kidnapping. That is why no one who had even an elementary understanding of the Eighth Commandment could ever use the Bible to justify the most common form of slavery, the kidnapping of human beings and selling them into slavery. Critics of the Bible argue that the Bible allowed slavery, but the type of slavery described was in almost all cases what was known as indentured servitude, the selling of oneself to another person for a fixed period of time in order to work off a debt. This had nothing to do with kidnapping free people, such as was done in Africa and elsewhere. That was expressly forbidden by the Eighth Commandment. The second significant meaning of the commandment against stealing is the sanctity of people's property. Just as we are forbidden to steal people, we are forbidden to steal what people own. It has been shown over and over that private property, beginning with land ownership, is indispensable to creating a free and decent society. Every totalitarian regime takes away private property rights. In the ancient and medieval world, a few rich people owned all the land, and the majority of the population worked on that land for the enrichment of the owners. And then, in 19th century Europe, many socialists argued for taking away private property and giving it to the quote-unquote people. Where that advice was followed, in what came to be known as the communist world, theft of property quickly resulted in theft of freedom and ultimately massive theft of life. The third enormously important meaning of the commandment against stealing concerns the many non-material things each person owns. Their reputation, their dignity, their trust, and their intellectual property. Let's quickly run through these. One, a person's reputation. Stealing a person's good name, whether through libel, slander, or gossip, is a particularly destructive form of theft. Because, unlike money or property, once a person's good name has been stolen, it can almost never be fully restored. Two, a person's dignity. The act of stealing a person's dignity is known as humiliation and humiliating a person, especially in public, can do permanent damage to what is perhaps the most precious thing any of us owns, our dignity. Three, a person's trust. Stealing a person's trust is known as deceiving someone. In fact, in Hebrew, a term for tricking someone is gnevat dat, which literally means stealing knowledge. One example is tricking people into buying something, as when a real estate agent omits telling a prospective purchaser all the flaws in a home in order to make a sale. Another example would be when someone deceives another person with insincere proclamations of love 
in order to obtain material or sexual favors. 4. A person's intellectual property. This form of theft includes anything from copying software or downloading music and movies without paying for them to stealing a person's words, what we know as plagiarism. Stealing a life, a person, a spouse, material property, intellectual property, a reputation, dignity, or trust, there is hardly any aspect of human life that is not harmed, sometimes irreparably so, by stealing. That is why it is fair to say that if everyone observed only one of the Ten Commandments, observing the commandment, do not steal, would, all by itself, make a beautiful world. I'm Dennis Prager. Well, there is Dennis Prager for this week on the Ten Commandments. Now, keep in mind when we when we do the, uh, we're going through these Ten Commandments, the purpose of this is not on the religious aspect of the Ten Commandments. It is on the political aspect of the Ten Commandments. The question we have is, what does it take to have an orderly society? And if we adhere to all of the Ten Commandments, those should really be the only laws that we need. Because if you're, well, t number one is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Two is, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh, four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Five, honor thy father and thy mother. And if you take the first five, those are more individualistic. That means if, if, you, if every single person takes these five into consideration, really the remaining five should already be taken care of. So then we have number six, thou shalt not kill. Um, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now number eight is thou shalt not steal. And so these are the ones in for our society. So if you're doing the first five, you shouldn't be killing, you shouldn't be committing adultery, you shouldn't be stealing. And then, of course, we have bear false witness against the neighbor and then covet, number 10. And we'll be getting into those two in the next couple of weeks. And that's really the whole essence of why we're running the, these episodes. We'll give you a little bit more in-depth look at the Ten Commandments, but instead of doing it in one massive dose, we'll just do it a little piecemeal at a time and keep it fresh and keep it interesting. And remember that all of our archives are on YouTube, so you can go ahead and check them out. You can also just check out Dennis Prager on Prager, U-P-R-A-G-E-R-U on YouTube. And you can get a whole listing of the Ten Commandments videos and a lot of the other videos that Dennis puts as he tries to explain the impact of policy on our daily lives. And speaking of policy and politics, there are only 37 more weeks before the next presidential inauguration. We're getting down. We're less than a year. We're less, uh, a little bit more than six months. And we have a lot that happened in this last week, especially with the Asala primary in uh, the Northeast. And let's take a look about Donald Trump with his magic number. Is it 1237? No, it's actually a lot less than that. Let's take a look. Before Tuesday night, it would have been presumptuous for Donald Trump to say, I consider myself the presumptive nominee. But the campaign's calculus, after Trump's trouncing of his rivals in Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island's primaries, gets simpler. I mean, I've always been very good at math. Since the kickoff caucus in Iowa, we've been talking about 1,237. That's the number of delegates required to clinch the Republican nomination. Now it's time to talk about the final 237. Mr. Trump entered Tuesday night's so-called Acela primary, a reference to the Amtrak high-speed East Coast corridor, with 845 bound delegates. He picked up around 105 more on Tuesday, finishing with around 950 delegates. And there's one stop the train skipped on this trip, New Jersey. When the Garden State's turn arrives on June 7th, he's considered a favorite there, and it's pretty much a given that thanks to it being a winner-take-all state, its 51 delegates will be all aboard the Trump car. That would get Trump to 1,000. 
Based on that assumption, Mr. Trump really only needs to worry about getting that magic remaining number of 237 more delegates. Excluding New Jersey, there are only around 450 delegates left for the taking, and Mr. Trump only needs around half of them to get those 237. The primary train next heads west, stopping off in Indiana on May 3rd, where 57 delegates await and where Senator Ted Cruz hopes to prevent Trump from winning the race outright and instead go to a contested convention. Now the media want to say everything is decided. And the question is, can the state of Indiana stop the media's chosen Republican candidates? Mr. Trump notes that legendary basketball coach Bobby Knight is supporting him in the Hoosier state. He's tough, he's sharp, he's smart, and he wins. The final contest on this wild ride that's been the Republican presidential preference contest includes on June 7th, California. It's got a huge delegate hall with 172 at stake, and Trump is doing well there. So the Golden State could be his golden opportunity to finish past the 1,237 mark. That's today's campaign calculus. And there you have it. We're getting down to the wire. Everything is going to be hinging right now upon what happens on Tuesday with the Hoosier primary in Indiana. 51 Republican delegates are at stake. And if they go to Donald Trump, uh, chances are that that's pretty much going to be the end of the race. And it'll be Donald Trump winning on the first ballot at the convention in July. But if Ted Cruz should make a final uh, last stand, he may still be able to deny Donald Trump the 1237. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Now we're going to take a look right now at what's happening on the Democrat side between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. So here's what I believe. I believe we can create more good jobs with rising incomes, jobs that provide dignity, pride, and a middle class life. We can renew our democracy by overturning Citizens United. We can lift up people and places who've been left out from our inner cities to Appalachia. In every manufacturing town hollowed out when the factory closed, every community scarred by substance abuse and addiction, every home where a child goes to bed hungry, that's what we Democrats believe in. That's what we know is possible. So we will build on a strong progressive tradition from Franklin Roosevelt to Barack Obama. And I applaud Senator Sanders and his millions of supporters for challenging us to get unaccountable money out of our politics and giving greater emphasis to closing the gap of inequality. And I know together we will get that done. Because whether you support Senator Sanders or you support me, there's much more that unites us than divides us. Now, the other day, Mr. Trump accused me of playing the, quote, woman card. Well, if fighting for women's health care and paid family leave and equal pay is playing the woman card, then deal me. base on Citizens United because you hear Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton and notice now Bernie Sanders for a year has been you know, hitting everybody upside the head about overturning Citizens United and here is Hillary Clinton stealing Bernie Sanders line on Citizens United but here's the thing about Citizens United the only thing it did was it made corp gave corporations the same level playing field as the unions in the ability to contribute to a PAC now, if you don't want to have corporations going to a PAC, then maybe we ought to just ban PACs altogether, and that includes PACs run by the AFL and CIO and SEIU. Ban those PACs, ban corporate PACs, everybody's on an even playing field. 
but Citizens United only levels that out. Now, of course, what they want is a union advantage on the Democrat side, which is what they've had for many, many, many years. You're not going to take corporate contributions out of politics. You're not going to take big money out of politics just by overturning Citizens United. That's a fallacy. The argument does not hold weight. Really, the only thing that I see that would at least regulate the money in politics would to make sure to take off the individual uh, contribution caps and make every single donation in kind and uh, financial reportable. If you give two cents or three dollars to a campaign, that's reportable just as much as if you give a million dollars. And then, like Virginia does with their VPAP system, vpap.org, they report every contribution online. So if you want to know who is buying and selling your favorite politician, all you have to do is go to one website that is constantly updated, and you know who is contributing what to whom. That seems to be a more accountable system and a way of regulating the money that's in politics than the super PACs and everything else. But that's where Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders both miss the boat. And speaking of unity, her, her uh, bit about I'm a uniter sounds like... George W. Bush, I'm a uniter, not a divider. Now, the Democrats laughed at George W. Bush when he said that, but here's Hillary Clinton saying exactly the same thing. She's got some pretty clever speech writers, I would admit. Anyhow, what does Bernie Sanders have to say regarding the prospect of he or Hillary Clinton going against Donald Trump? Let's check this out. In the last, last several weeks, the national polls they don't show us 60 points down. A few of them have us actually ahead or a few points down. And what is also extremely important, if the Democratic Party is to look at which candidate is the candidate to defeat Donald Trump or any other Republican, What we are seeing on national polls, which have us 15, 20 points ahead of Donald Trump, far more than Secretary Clinton. Almost, almost every national poll and every state poll has us defeating Trump, and that margin for us is significantly larger than that of Secretary Clinton. We're just finishing up a big Tuesday prime. We'll get to that in just a second, but here's the thing about who matches up well against who in the polls for the general election. It doesn't matter. It does not matter one bit right now because the public's attention, the voters' attention, is on the primary. Just like I'd heard comments from Republicans this last week, actually yesterday, saying how uh, it doesn't bode well because the Democrats have a higher turnout in the primaries than the general. Guess what, folks? It doesn't matter. Uh, Democrats traditionally have had higher primary voter turnout than Republicans. That's just the way the game is played on the Democrat side. Republicans, they don't go out and turn out for primaries. That's just the way it is. And it's up to each campaign to motivate the people to vote for them. But when your choices are narrowed, and there are people who say, well, I really don't care who, is, who, uh, who comes out of it between those two, well, you're going to have a much lower Republican vote uh, total. That's just the way it goes. But that is not indicative of what will happen in the general election. And John Kasich does the same thing in the Republicans. I'm the only one who polls well against the Democrats. I can beat them both. John Kasich is not going to be the presidential nominee. That's really what it's coming down to. John Kasich is not going to be the nominee. He may poll well right now, five or six months before the general election. But as soon as the nomination is locked up and we see the head-to-head -head matchup, that's when people are going to have to make their choice between those candidates. There are no other options. That's the way it works in politics. That's the way it's always worked in politics, with the exception of a, only a few times when you've had third 
party candidates, and you even had, had three four-way races in uh, American history. And we've highlighted uh, a couple of those uh, four-way races, 1824, 1860, 1912, on this program in earlier episodes. So who's going to match up against who? That's still going to be determined once somebody gets the actual nomination. That holds true for both parties. And then at that point in time, people are going to have to decide. If it's Trump versus Hillary, they're going to have to decide, do you really like either of these? Or do you like one of them more than the other? Is there one that you have to go and vote against? Or is there somebody you can vote for? That's what the, what's going to be what the decision is going to be. If Ted Cruz becomes the nominee against Bernie Sanders, are you going to like Ted Cruz more or are you going to like Bernie Sanders more or do you really not care? And that's what we're dealing with in this election cycle. We're go we may be dealing with a very apathetical elector electorate uh, come November. It might be a very low voter turnout for each either party. So you cannot insinuate right now who is going to be the best general election matchup because it just doesn't work that way. Historically, it has never come down to that way. This is an election where it might just come down to who you dislike the most. So now we have three takeaways from what happened on Tuesday night from the Wall Street Journal. Let's check this out. We're just finishing up a big Tuesday primary day, primaries in five states in both parties. Outcome is sort of predictable. Donald Trump won all five states that were in play Tuesday. Hillary Clinton won the big states on the Democratic side. So the question is, did we learn anything new? Did the ball move forward in any way? Well, I think uh, significant things happened on three fronts this Tuesday. A, both candidates in the front, which is to say Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, move forward on the all-important delegate math front. They're both moving inexorably toward a point where it's going to be very hard for anybody to stop them from getting the delegates they need to win on the first ballot at their respective conventions. Hillary Clinton may essentially already be there. Donald Trump it looked a few weeks ago as if he couldn't get there. The margins of victories he's rolling up now suggest it's possible, and in fact, he may be on his way to doing that. Secondly, psychologically, they're both creating a kind of an air of inevitability, which just makes it easier to continue to roll up big numbers in other states and to win over whatever available delegates are still out there. Uh, but third, I think we're also learning that in both parties, the end is going to be ugly, not pretty, which is to say we saw from the losers on Tuesday, Bernie Sanders on the Democratic Party and Ted Cruz on the Republican side, that they're not going down. Down. Ted Cruz is going to fight on through Indiana next week at a minimum, said essentially, don't count me out, I'm going to win in Indiana, and it's on to California, this fight is continuing. And Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side said much the same thing. He was in West Virginia, which doesn't vote for two more weeks, and he said, we're going to win here, we're going to continue to rack up delegates. I still think I can turn around some of those super delegates who are supporting Hillary Clinton right now and that give her the margin of victory she will need. So the end may not be pretty, but it does seem as if it's uh, more and more ordained. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump had good nights on Tuesday night. So Tuesday night, Hillary and Donald had both had amazing nights. They sure did. I do believe that Ted Cruz underperformed. I think Bernie Sanders performed fairly well, just not enough to go over the top. Um, we'll see what happens. Tuesday this coming Tuesday in Indiana is going to be a big night, especially for Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders, because both of them may have their political futures at stake. And so we'll find out what happens in uh, a little, not too long from now. Uh, anyhow, uh, Christmas is coming. 238 more shopping days left until Christmas. And on Wednesday, it felt like Christmas for one political candidate. Let's check this out. Elections are about choices. The Republican Party faces a choice today. Indiana and America, I believe, want to unite behind a positive, optimistic, forward-looking, conservative campaign based on real policy solutions to the problems facing this country. Pleased to introduce to you an extraordinary leader, my friend, and the next Vice President of the United States, Carly Fiorina.
am very proud and very humbled and honored to announce that I have accepted Senator Ted Cruz's offer to be his vice president for the Republican nomination. You know, last night it was pretty clear. Everybody in the media, the establishment, the elites, they all said, well, it's over. I mean, it's over. Donald Trump won. But it isn't over. It isn't over because you and people all across the great Hoosier state, people all across this nation know that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both will be disastrous for this nation. You know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, they are two sides of the same coin. They're both liberal, we know that. But, you know, Hillary Clinton, like so many politicians, Hillary Clinton has made her millions selling access and influence from inside the system. And Donald Trump has made his billions buying people like Hillary Clinton. They are not going to challenge the system that has sold us all down the river. They're not going to challenge the elites. They're not going to challenge the crony capitalists. They're not going to challenge the Washington insiders. They're not going to challenge the lobbyists. Gosh, their campaign is filled with them. No, they're not going to challenge the system. They are the system. This is the fight of our time. And I believe Ted Cruz is the man to lead that fight. And I am prepared to stand by his side and give this everything I have to restore the soul of our party. And that was Chris, a Christmas present on Wednesday for Carly Fiorina, the one-time uh, Hewlett-Packard CEO who ran for the U.S. Senate in California in the last election we'll cycle. She ran for, for president we'll earlier in this election question, cycle. And she is now on the ticket with Ted Cruz, if Ted Cruz gets the nomination. And taking a look at the Indiana Republican presidential primary on Real Clear Politics, we have Donald Trump on the Real Clear Politics average. Donald Trump, 37.5. Ted Cruz, 35.2. With John Kasich at 18.2, which means if the average holds correct, it's going to be a very close race. Uh, but then polls have been wrong before. So we'll see exactly what happens uh, when results are announced. And on the Indiana Democratic presidential primary... Hillary Clinton, 51%, oh, excuse me, 49.6%. Uh, Bernie Sanders, 43% on the Real Clear Politics average of polls. So it looks like both of these races may very well come down to the wire. Donald Trump, knowing that he is close to getting the nomination, tried looking presidential last week. He gave a foreign policy address. And let's check out what he had to say. Donald Trump called for a shakeup of U.S. diplomacy Wednesday during prepared remarks on foreign policy in Washington, D.C. While Trump's speech was mostly devoid of new proposals, here are three key ways his foreign policy stance appeared to evolve. First, Trump toned down his rhetoric on immigration. The businessman didn't mention Mexico once, and though he did refer to borders, the only time Trump talked about a wall was when he praised a former U.S. president for helping tear one down. Democrats and Republicans working together got Mr. Gorbachev to heed the words of President Reagan, our great president, when he said, tear down this wall. That's a far cry from Trump's famous campaign promise. Mexico, we're going to build a wall. It's going to be a great wall. It's going to be a real wall. Secondly, Trump acknowledged the U.S. needs to work with Muslim allies to stop the spread of terrorism and that ISIS can't be defeated by military force alone. Here are some of his previous comments about the terrorist group. I would bomb the shit out of them. You have to take out their families. And here's what Trump said in his speech. Containing the spread of radical Islam must be a major foreign policy goal of the United States. In this, we're going to be working very closely with our allies in the Muslim world, all of which are at risk 
from radical Islamic violence. Third, Trump seemed to clarify his stance on diplomacy with Russia and China. In the past, Trump has threatened China with a trade war for various reasons. I would certainly start taxing goods that come in from China. And the businessman previously raised eyebrows when he seemed to embrace the idea of an alliance with Russian President Vladimir Putin. If Russia wants to bomb the hell out of ISIS and join us in that effort, I am absolutely fine with it. I think that's an asset, not a liability. In his speech, Trump said this about the two countries. We desire to live peacefully and in friendship with Russia and China. We have serious differences with these two nations and must regard them with open eyes. But we are not bound to be adversaries. In what many saw as an attempt to appear more presidential, Trump used a teleprompter to deliver his speech, which is uncommon for the unscripted businessman. While some of his stances seem to have evolved, Trump remained critical of President Obama and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and he never wavered from his campaign pledge to make America great again. We must make America truly wealthy again, and we must, we have to, and we will make America great again. And if we do that, perhaps this century can be the most peaceful and prosperous the world has ever, ever known. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that was Donald Trump last week on foreign policy. And you notice the difference that he's using a teleprompter now. He's being more deliberative in his, in his words, in his speaking, and he's not, not talking off the cuff. Um, I, I really think now Donald Trump is at that point where he wants it because he knows it's so close. And I had said before, early on when he was being really bombastic, I didn't think Donald Trump wanted the nomination. He wanted to leave, and he just wanted to say, I could have done this. Uh, I have to tell you, I could have done this. Well, that, you know, that's, I think, what Donald Trump really wanted, kind of like the Jesse Ventura effect. Ventura, I don't think he really wanted it at first. It wasn't until a certain point in that campaign in 1998 where he realized he could win that, and then things changed. And I've noticed a change in Donald Trump, and now I think he sees he may actually be president, or at least the nominee, nominee and he better start acting presidential. So I think what we're seeing right now is... Um, well, one, um, Donald Trump off the teleprompter is a lot like Barack Obama off the teleprompter. Neither of these guys can really give a good speech off teleprompter. I think in uh, Obama's, well, in uh, Trump's case, I think it's just a matter of measuring his words, whereas I think in Obama's case, it's a matter of collecting his thoughts. Uh, just a difference in styles between the two. But right now, we're actually going to do a historical segment. I want to transition to that while we have time because we had an important anniversary that happened this past week. 30 years ago, April 26, 1986, there was a nuclear explosion in Chernobyl, Russia. And that actually had a very, it was a very, very big deal. I remember when it happened. I remember it was in the news. For being in the middle of the Cold War, it was always, all oh, those commies, that was the term used around, those commies, uh, the commies are blowing themselves up with a reactor, good for them. You know, that, that was kind of the Cold War mentality. But 30, 30 years removed from that, let's actually take a look at what happened and what its long-lasting uh, consequences have been in that region. So let's take a look at this video on Chernobyl. That Soviet nuclear accident in the Ukraine created fallout today in Chicago. We do know that a zone of deadly radiation is being released from the damaged plant and the accident is far from over. Nuclear power plant accident inside the Soviet Union. It's radiation levels around the plant up to three times the natural radiation levels. They assume they got a leak. Chernobyl accident is almost half a world away. Residents throughout the Northland are worried. Worried about the possible health effects from fallout. Worried about the safety of our own nuclear reactors. And worried about the possible economic consequences of the accident. On the 26th of April, 1986, an event took place that officially killed 31 people and left an unknown number of people affected for the rest of their lives. It rewrote the safety rules in nuclear energy and caused the 1,000 mile radius to be safely uninhabitable to humans for a few hundred years. 
It was the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and in this video you will see that if it wasn't for three almost forgotten heroes, things could have been so much worse. First let's go back to March 1970. Work begins on the construction of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant located near the city of Chernobyl and Pripyat in northern Ukraine. By 1983, four nuclear reactors are built, and between them they are powering 10% of Ukraine's electricity. Fast forward to the early hours of the 26th of November 1986, 16 years after the plant's commission, and workers at the nuclear plant are carrying out a test on reactor number 4. There are many inaccuracies and thoughts that the test violated several safety regulations, and this combined with the flawed design in the reactors used at Chernobyl caused a sudden power surge and an emergency shutdown was implemented. This failed, and as the workers could feel the ground trembling beneath them, they knew something bad was coming. Seconds later, an explosion occurs, followed by a second, more powerful explosion that blasts the 12-ton cover off of the reactor into the air, releasing deadly radioactive vapour and a spray of colourful bright fire 1,000 metres into the sky. The alarms were activated and the first on the scene were firemen. It said they had no idea what they were dealing with but knew the risks of the radiation and if they had followed regulations they would have never gone near the reactor but had no choice. They tackled the blades without any protective gear, exposing themselves to deadly radiation, and despite their efforts, the fire could not be brought under control. Two men died that day. The night shift main circulating pump operator, who was most likely killed immediately as his body was never discovered, and the automatic systems adjuster who was found unconscious in room 604, pinned under a fallen beam and was contaminated by radioactive water. To show how much radiation this man had been exposed to, one of the power plant workers suffered a radiation burn on his back, where this man's hand was located when he helped carry him out. There is an unconfirmed story that shortly after the explosion, many locals gathered on a railway bridge that had a good view of the nuclear plant to witness the colourful flames coming from the reactor. They had no idea that in the air was a lethal dose of radiation, apparently no one survived and the bridge is now referred to as the Bridge of Death. Like I said, this is unconfirmed, but the bridge does exist, and if people were stood there for long enough, there is no denying they would have been exposed to deadly amounts of radiation. Tales aside, in the days that followed the explosion, the authorities were slow to react and acknowledge the dangers posed by this accident. They were in fact in denial that any radiation was leaking out, and told higher class officials who were ringing and wondering what had happened, that everything was under control and that the radiation levels were maxing out on their meters, but the max out limit that these meters were capable of showing was nothing worth evacuating the area for. Of course, in reality, the level of radiation in the area was above and beyond anything their meters could read, and radiation levels were astronomically high. In the nearby town of Pripyat, the people were told that it was a fire at the power plant and that they had nothing to worry about, so life carried on as normal, Children went to school and residents went to work, completely oblivious to the invisible lethal radiation they were being exposed to. The levels were 15,000 times higher than usual and rising. It took 30 hours before the Pripyat residents were ordered to evacuate. An 18 mile area around the power plant was closed and residents were given two hours notice to gather their belongings and get out. They were told they'd be returning in a few days, but this never happened. Around 43,000 people who once called Pripyat their home were now known as the first atomic refugees, a title they never imagined being given. The only people left in the area was one old man who refused to evacuate and was found dead in his home just a few weeks later, and the military and scientific delegates who were tasked with getting the still-burning reactor under control. They were living unprotected in the local hotel, seemingly unaware of the dangers posed to them from the extremely high levels of radiation. In the days after the explosion, clouds of radioactive matter were being blown north, drifting over Russia and reaching as far as Sweden. Despite radioactive dust raining down on Stockholm, there was still no official report outside of the Soviet Union. It took three days for the rest of the world to know, and this coincided with the report that a US spy satellite had spotted the wreckage of the burning Chernobyl plant. By now, the whole of Europe was at risk of contamination. The plant was still burning and something had to be done urgently to put out the fire and seal reactor number 4 to prevent any more radiation from spewing out. Pilots were brought in to fly helicopters above the reactor and dropped thousands of tons of sand, clay and neutron absorbing boron onto the blaze in an attempt to smother the flames and neutralize the radiation. Many soldiers would pour the sand in from sacks whilst hovering directly above the reactor. A week later, although the flames were brought somewhat under control, the heat had not, and it was causing the base of the reactor to crack. The workers knew that below the reactor was a water reservoir and also a basement that would have been filled with water from the firefighters' water hoses. 
If the radioactive magma made contact with the pool of water underneath, this would have caused a massive steam explosion, throwing out more radioactive material from the reactor into the air. Therefore, it was absolutely necessary to drain this water. By doing so, another explosion could be prevented, and the area below the reactor could then be filled with liquid nitrogen to cool it. Three plant workers who knew where the valves were that would allow the water to drain volunteered to go down there. These brave men went underneath with what turned out to be a faulty lamp to locate the valves in complete darkness and swam through highly radioactive water. They opened the valves and returned back, but sadly all died shortly after from the radiation, something they knew would happen as a result of their heroic feat. With the water drained, the authorities called on the help of 10,000 miners, with the aim of tunneling underneath the reactor to cool the base down and stop it from melting through the ground by pumping in liquid nitrogen. There is some doubt as to whether this operation was completed, because I have found conflicting reports, but eventually it seems the liquid nitrogen was stopped and the area beneath the reactor was filled with concrete. Whatever happened, those three men prevented another explosion, and if they hadn't have, you probably wouldn't be listening to me right now, as the explosion would have been so catastrophic, it would have put the whole of Europe at risk. With the area somewhat under control and the threat of another explosion eliminated, workers set about sealing up the reactor in order to minimize the spread of radiation. A massive structure was designed and it became known as Project Sarcophagus. It covered the exploded reactor and was completed by December 1986, eight months after the disaster. There is thought to be around 800,000 people who risked their lives in 1986 in an attempt to contain and clean up the Chernobyl disaster site. Many of these heroic people received medals for their work and 28 died as a result of acute radiation sickness in the weeks after initial exposure. With this, the long-term effects of the millions of other people exposed is unclear and there is no definitive figure on how many people now suffer long-term health problems, have died prematurely, or how many people have given birth to defected children. But it's thought thousands of extra cancer deaths have been directly caused by the accident, although officials are still reluctant to associate these deaths to the Chernobyl disaster. The effects of the disaster are still very real to this day. The exclusion zone covers an area of 1,000 miles around the power plant, and although many live in this area at their own risk, mainly workers, Pripyat and many other areas close to the reactor are ghost towns. Nobody ever returned to live there, and the haunted images show how lives must have been shattered that day. One astonishing thing about the area surrounding the Chernobyl plant though, is the abundant wildlife. Despite the area still being contaminated, many animals who were disappearing from the area around the power plant prior to the accident have thrived, and studies have shown that deer, elk, wolves and wild boar seem relatively unaffected by the contaminated land. These findings contradict original thoughts that the disaster would have a detrimental and devastating effect on the local wildlife, creating deformed alien-like radioactive creatures, but they all seem to be living happily in the environment, although some animals have had a rise in deformities and the invertebrate population has decreased, but nowhere near like experts had predicted. The Chernobyl disaster initially took the lives of two workers, followed by 29 people later from radiation-related deaths and four men from a helicopter that crashed trying to contain the fire at the plant. In total, the Chernobyl accident cost the Soviet Union the equivalent of 200 billion pounds and drove millions from their homes, making it the biggest nuclear disaster in history and we can all only hope that it will stay that way forever. I never really knew the full extent of this disaster before heavily researching it, and I've realised how devastating it must have been for those involved. I hope I have shone some light on the build-up, the event and the aftermath, and also those three men who prevented something much, much worse from taking place. I hope you've enjoyed this video, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next one. So that's a little bit more about how serious the Chernobyl incident was that was 30 years ago. Uh, but as they had said in that documentary, it's interesting to see what's happen happening to the wildlife inside the exclusion zone. And we're going to actually take a quick look at what's happening with a, uh, through a wildlife biologist. Let's go right to the film.
our cough, I guess. Uh, I guess we didn't queue up the right video that we want to show you. But I wanted to make a mention here of the sarcophagus. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be built to contain the radiation in reactor number four. Uh, our cellar middle, I believe it is, uh, yeah, our cellar middle is the steel company that is putting, is responsible for the steel going into that, um, the sarcophagus. And they use iron that is mined in northern Minnesota. So Minnesota has a connection to the sarcophagus at Chernobyl. Minnesota iron mined by, most likely by Cliffs Natural Resources, uh, which is a big customer of our cellar middle, middle. And uh, they are using that steel to build the sarcophagus in Russia to contain the rea uh, nuclear radiation uh, from being airborne contaminants for the next 100 years. So that's a little, little side trivia for you. Now we're going to uh, go to the Animals of Chernobyl video as we had promised you. All right, well, it looks like a nice spider web over here. Let's see if we can't catch this on film. Um, we missed it up a little bit. You know, what was invisible now becomes visible. Nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes, we're having technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, Please this, stand this one's by. sitting in, at, in being bathed in about 45 microsieverts per hour, plus or minus, which is pretty darn radioactive. In 1986, an explosion and fire at the nuclear reactor in what was then the Soviet Union in Chernobyl, Ukraine, launched a plume of radioactive fallout that rendered a large swath of the region here uninhabitable. Dallas, my, I'm, Since then, the, the camera's on me. It's not on the thousand mile exclusion zone prohibiting video. human there activity has led some to declare the area a restored Eden, brimming with wildlife. But for more than a decade, Timothy Mousseau, an American scientist, has conducted an extensive biological survey here, and his studies have shown that life has been far more slow to recover than previously believed. So it's a perfect area for biological studies because we see a diversity of, of plants and animals. It's one of the hotter areas uh, in the Chernobyl zone, and, and so from our previous work we know that this, this level of, of chronic exposure is above that that most species will tolerate. Nothing here. Okay. Uh, this year we've been looking at the small rodents, we've been looking at spiders. Earlier this year we were here working with the birds. We found that the abundance of many species of birds are depressed in these areas of high contamination, leading to an overall decrease in the biodiversity on the order of 50% you know, fewer species in hot areas than there should be uh, if, there had, if there wasn't radioactivity in the area. Mousseau says he has seen much higher frequencies of tumors and physical abnormalities, like deformed beaks among birds, compared with those from uncontaminated areas. He has measured declines in populations of insects and spiders. And yet, in a recent paper released last month, Mousseau has also shown that some birds here may actually be adapting to high radiation levels. So these are uh, special digital audio recorders that are designed to pick up the high frequency sounds that bats produce while they're echolocating and flying around and trying to capture insects. And by the frequency of calls, we can get an idea of the abundance of bats. Yeah, look at these mushrooms here. <laughs> Let's see if it goes up. Well, look at that, eh? Uh, oh, 43. So 42, 43. So, yeah, this mushroom is definitely much hotter than the surrounding areas. The legacy of Chernobyl, Musso says, can be seen not just in animal life. Cut trees here show a dramatic change in the color of their rings, exactly in 1986. It occurred to us uh, after visiting Fukushima uh, last year that some of those spiderwebs looked a little strange. And, and, and so we thought we would 
test that hypothesis in a very scientific way by, by capturing images of as many spider webs as we, can, as we can find in hot and cold areas of the same kinds of species to see if there's more variability or you know, less, less, less structure to the webs in these radioactive areas. It can serve as a, as a biomarker of the background radiation. We're in the town of Chernobyl, uh, downtown Chernobyl as it were, and what we found is that the frequency of aberrant color patterns on the, on the backsides of these bugs is directly proportional to how radioactive the area is. The one on this side is relatively normal, and then you look on the other one and you see that the black spots are kind of fused together. Thank you. Rousseau's work in Chernobyl will continue for years to come. He's extended his study to Fukushima, Japan, and hopes to shed a brighter light on the lasting effects of radiation on biological systems, including humans. So now, I hope you understand, if you haven't noticed before, that we were extremely close to something that could have brought about a world extinction or something that was more massive than it actually came out to be. Uh, I had actually looked at one video that I just didn't get a chance to uh, you know, show um, you know, today, but there was, it shows the radiation plume and it spread over Sweden, Finland, Russia, and then how the winds just swirled it all over Europe. And can you imagine what that would have been if it would have gone over the North Pole and settled over us? That was not far from consideration, and it could have easily happened. And that just shows just how serious that disaster was. And if we go back to the Fukushima reactor in Japan a couple of years ago, I mean, that was serious for groundwater contamination, and yes, even for the... the um, radiation plume coming out of there, but nuclear accidents are really, really serious. I'm going to go back to 1979 in Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. That was a serious matter as well, even though the uh, amount of radiation that escaped was extremely null. Uh, but again, it could have been a lot worse. Now, I'm not going to be one to say we have to ban nuclear at all because of all of this, that, and the other. No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I'm just saying that it has to be closely watched and monitored uh, and all the safety precautions need to be taken because Chernobyl should always be a permanent reminder of what can happen when things go wrong. And we just need to learn from it and that's why I'm glad they took the wildlife biologists through, you know, through the exclusion zone and done a multi-year study because that way they can find out something long term with how the radiation impacts animals and subsequently people. And so I think there's some good that's coming out of this and it's something that we've noticed with Fukushima you know, and, and you know that last video showed the difference with the spiders and you wouldn't think the spiders would really have a big thing to do with um, studying radioactive exposure but it does. But right now we're going to show you a video provided we're ready this time of the um, well, there's the sarcophagus again uh, with Minnesota iron in it. And this is a drone that is um, going over the Chernobyl area. And this is just, it was taken over a period of a couple of years, I think it was like 2013 to 15. And so what we're showing is just some aerial shots. I think this is the video we just played. Yeah. So we're showing it to you again. This is a sarcophagus. I was hoping to show you the drone footage from the city and the town, but um, no, we're just having too many te technical difficulties today. That happens. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it, but 
you know, we know now just how serious Chernobyl was. And, you know, again, nuclear accidents and incidents are, are nothing to trifle at. But I'm just really glad that in the long run we have a chance to see and understand what it is that's exactly that's, you know, how, how this impacts um, everything. But anyhow, let's, uh, let's move a little bit forward here because we try to end with a musical number. And we're not going to quite end the show just yet. We've got a little bit more time. Uh, but the Red Army Choir, it's actually known as the Alexandrov Ensemble. They are the official Russian military band. Uh, but because we're dealing with Chernobyl, uh, I find it only right as we give our musical tributes that we do something with a Russian theme today. So we're going to show you the Alexandrov Ensemble with the Russian National Anthem. And this is just to remember those who lost their lives at the Chernobyl. <laughs> And that was the Alexandrov Ensemble with the Russian National Anthem. The one thing I really hope that does not happen politically in the United States of America is I really hope we don't get the Cold War back again. Uh, you know, and I see comments from all of the can candidates for president right now kind of suggesting that. And I see the actions of Vladimir Putin also kind of suggesting that. Um, what do we do? I mean, we've had a Cold War now with, the, uh, with Russia since 1946. Um, I, I really wish cooler heads would prevail. I mean, I thought we had some peace for a while. Um, I really think that there's some international cooperation. And we see that with the space program. We see cooperation between the Russians and the Americans on the space program. Uh, and that started in 1975 with the Apollo-Soyuz uh, test project. And I think, really, we need to see more joint ventures between the United States and, and Russia. And we need to end this Cold War once and for all. But until we can get the politicians from both parties and from the U.S. and Russia to kind of understand that, the Cold War is just going to continue. I think it's just kind of subsided, but I don't think it's ever really gone away. Anyhow, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. YouTube.com slash North We'll see you next week.